Hello. Hi. I'm the last speaker, so I'm stay with me for a long time. <laughs> I'm going to take my time. No, 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 I'm just joking. Okay, uh, the title of my talk, Untitled, The Black Man. <laughs> but before I go on, uh, what I'm going to share with you are stories um, and about storytellers. I think there's a storyteller in all, all of us, each one of us, and I've met great storytellers who have shaped my future. I am the I in the CMIO. I am a minority of the minorities. I'm, uh, we are 7.57% of the 7.4% of the population. We are Malayalis. So I was born in 1965. I'm sure uh, three quarters of you were not even uh, uh, of, of that time. I'm sure all of you are very young. But I was born in 1965 when the future of the country was very bleak. And so was my future at that time. Because the British had, were leaving the country uh, after ruling you know, Singapore or Malaya for, at that time for a, long, uh, for a long period. And the Malayali community, we were living in Silita Hills and Jalan Kayu because uh, all, most of us worked uh, my grandparents and my grandfather and my father worked for the RSAF, which is the Royal Air Force. Sorry, RAF, not RSAF, RAF. So, my grandfather was more English than the English. <laughs> so, what happened was, you know, the British were leaving and all of them were unemployed. My grandfather and my father were totally unemployed and they had no idea what they were going to do. So, when the British were leaving, they decided that Okay, all those people who had worked for us, we will give you citizenship to go to the UK. So my destiny would have changed. I wouldn't be here speaking to any one of you because I would have been in Brick Lane in the UK if we had left. My grandfather, after the British left, we faced another colonial master, which was my grandfather in the, in the house. He was a tyrant. So he had a problem with us staying back in Singapore. He wanted to go with the British. He said, we came with the British, we leave with them. And you know, my mother stood her ground because my parents were born here. And my mother stood her ground and she said, no, she's not going to bring us to the UK. But she didn't know how to tell this to my uh, grandfather because at that time, daughter-in-laws do not speak directly to their father-in-laws. But eventually, through my father, my grandfather suddenly said, okay, and, you know, my mother got her way and we all stayed behind. My mother's thing was, you know, if we go to another country, we will be second-class citizens. Why don't we stay in the country we were born into? Yeah, we will face a hard future. Maybe the, there's uncertainty in, in the future, but we can do it. And she actually encouraged my father. Eventually, my father joined the Singapore Armed Forces and he became an officer. But at that time, uh, it was something else happened to me because my father was very far-sighted. So when I went into school at the age of seven, he, he made me take Mandarin as a second language. And that created an identity crisis for me. So, you see, with the colonial story about, you know, uh, SG, uh, 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 with, the, with my family and, you know, about going to the UK and losing our citizenship, I made a film called The Flame, which was a love letter to Singapore. I, and 50 years later, I was asked to make a film. And they said to me, it should be a love letter to Singapore. So I made the story about my family. And they were the first storytellers that I met in my life. And that was the, flame, uh, the film that I made, called, a short film called The Flame. Then when I was in primary, now I'll continue because I've, I'm supposed to tell you through how I discovered my identity through my film. So I'm, I'm really jumping the gun here. So it's the, the first film that you know, I wanted to share with you was about the flame. And then now, when I was in primary school, when I was seven, my father asked me to learn Mandarin. And that created an identity crisis for me because I wanted to be Chinese after that. I didn't want to be Indian because Every time I went into the Chinese class, the teacher would take me and put me in the Tamil class. She said, you didn't belong here. 
And then the Tamil teacher will say, no, you don't belong here, you have to go into the Chinese class. And that created a big problem for me because I didn't know who I was. You know, it was like, who am I, Indian, Chinese? And I had a lot of Chinese friends after that. And, but the problem became worse because, you know, uh, my Chinese friends started making fun of me because I would, you know, speak with an Indian accent because, you know, certain words, you, you pronounce oil or oil, you know, there was a problem with that. Or, you know, sometimes I would tell them about the Indian movie that I'd watch and they'll just make fun and say, oh, the ones that you run around trees. And then eventually it created, it created a complex within me. I didn't want to be Indian. For the longest time, my mother would put oil on my hair and send me to school. And they'll say, oh, so smelly, you Indian. You know, so these things, you know, we were children. It was ignorance. You know, now I'm not even angry. They're still my friends. But the thing is that, you know, at that time, it was, you know, it created a complex within me. That mom, I, I told my mother, I said, I don't want to be Indian. Don't, I don't want to put that oil. You know, everyone's saying that it's smelly. And, you know, there were repercussions to that, this because I lost all my hair. <laughs> I should have listened to my mother. <laughs> but you see, that was the beginning of something that created a, a big denial within me, that I was ashamed of my own race. I did not want to be Indian. And you know, for the longest time, you know, it, uh, it was a problem because I would shy away from talking about anything Indian, whether it was my language, whether it was my home, you know, I, I had to behave differently. You know, even at home, you know, I, I had to shun everything. If they said to me to speak in my mother tongue, I would refuse. I would only want to speak in English. So, you know, these, these were the problems that I had growing up and which created a huge complex. So my, ma my aunt was a storyteller and she was the other person that I met who introduced me to films. Because we were all, uh, we, we were all uh, not allowed to go to the movies at that time. Because, you know, we were children, not enough money, five of us, forget it, too expensive. So my aunt would go to the movies. She used to go to the New World, uh, at, uh, at, uh, yeah, now it's called City Square Mall. And she would go there and watch all these Tam uh, Tamil movies and she would come and tell us stories. And then that created a huge imagination in my mind about films and stories. And many years later, when the museum asked me to make a film about a place that I, I had an affinity to, I made the film called The New World. And it was about a boy going to the cinemas. And then, after when I grew up, I finished my national service, I was introduced. I, I, I kind of loved acting. You know, I always, I was a storyteller in school and things like that, and I loved acting. I was introduced to William Teo, and he casted me in a play called Medea. It was the first uh, outdoor play uh, at Fort Canning. And then I went on to do a workshop with Kor Parkun. And you know, they taught me everything I know about acting. And another person uh, uh, who made a difference was Ong Keng Sen at Theatre Works, because they told me everything I knew about directing, about directing actors, about working with actors. And it was during this time that I was, uh, feeling another, a different kind of frustration about being Indian because there were no real parts ever as an actor for me to play in these, uh, in these uh, plays because there were, there were no writings, there was no voice for uh, uh, nice Indian characters. I, was, I remember I played a, a peacock dancer, uh, I was uh, a policeman, I was a coolie, and in, you know, all the, and even a prata seller, so all these times, you know, that you know, you're given these parts, but it was great because I tell you, I worked with the best directors at that time. And, you know, but it was on some acting and things like that. But again, I was very frustrated because I couldn't prove myself. I, I want to tell my stories, you know, but there was no, no real opportunity. So after 10 years of acting in English theater, I decided that I was going to stop. And at the time, the scene changed as well, because a lot of them became full-time actors. You know, people gave up their jobs to become actors. Of course, I couldn't, you know, I, uh, I had commitments, so I had to go to work. And, you know, because before, we used to do it part-time. But now, uh, you know, they were full-time theaters, the schools were opening up and things like that. And, you know, it was the who of who of theater today, like Ivan Heng, Tan Keng Hua, Nyo Swilin, Lim Kay Siu, 
uh, Meng Chu. All these people were doing theater full time and, and they were my friends. But I had to step out, you know, and not do these plays anymore. Then there was a period in my, uh, in my life where I felt very redundant. I couldn't express myself. I couldn't tell my stories. I just felt very, 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 very uh, sad about, you know, not being able to be creative anymore. Then I took on a job uh, as a night auditor in Little India, Virasami Road. It's no more. The hotel is no, it's a, not even a hotel. It's like a motel. Uh, and I was there working, uh, moonlighting actually. And uh, I came across a whole lot of people from different countries, Sri Lanka, India, and they were there. There was a whole influx of Indians who came in the 1990s uh, as foreign workers. And there were these Sri Lankans who were running away from their countries, trying to seek asylum uh, uh, in, and, going to, and wanting to go to Europe. So they were all uh, living in this hotel. And, you know, sometimes uh, even the sex workers on the streets would come running to me to ask them to save, uh, save them from the pimps. So I would open the door and let them sleep inside without the boss knowing, of course. And even the illegal workers, I, you know, now they've all gone back, so I can say this. They, uh, you know, I would let them sleep uh, in, the, in the hotel. But what happened then was the, the stories that they told me affected me a lot. And the one phrase that they would always say because they were so worried was, I can't sleep tonight. I can't sleep. And I couldn't sleep either because I was working. I had to work the night shift. So I wrote a story. I wrote a story one night, just like that, and I, and I titled it, I Can't Sleep Tonight, which was my first film. And this film changed my life because I was very inspired by Adul Gopal Krishnan. He was a Malayalam filmmaker, The Rat Trap. When I was young, I watched this film, and I was very influenced by his films. And then when I made my film, I wanted to make it just like how he would, right? So I made this film called I Can't Sleep Tonight. Now, at that time, I was not even schooled in filmmaking. I had not seen a camera, not been to film school. There were no film schools at that time. There was nothing. So I decided to call upon a friend who was working in Mediacom. So she came, Rose Sivam, she came, uh, and I told her that, okay, bring a cameraman, bring a camera, and we've got to shoot this story in Little India. I had no actors. I used everyone that I knew, friends and people, real people who were uh, uh, on that street. And one Sunday night when it was so crowded, I shot my film. And I was so happy that I could again tell stories. Not, now not as an actor, but as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. This again, you know, gave me new life. So I decided to enter this film at the Singapore International Film Festival. It was a, a platform, there was a platform for short filmmaking. So I entered the film and I won. But that was not the biggest thing for me. I was 30 years old, I had no education in film, and I won this first prize. It was the only prize they gave for, that, for the short film competition that year. But who was the jury? Adur Gopalakrishnan. And I didn't know. He came, when, when I went there, he gave me my first award. I was stunned. I said to myself, wow, what more can I ask for? Just when you thought, you know, everything was over at the age of 30, when, you know, you had to actually do all sorts of things, like get a proper job and everything, I was allowed to make films, you know, and that because, you know, I had all this encouragement from people, you know, platforms, you know, these storytellers who encouraged me, whether it was my family or my aunt or the theatre directors that I worked with. And then... I, uh, when I got the award, I met him and I said, you know, I want to come with you. I want to join you. I want to see how you make films. And he said to me, okay, then you have to give me five years of your life because that's how long I, how long I take to make one film. And of course, I was a coward. I didn't go. You know, I wanted to stay on. I didn't take that step. But I continued making films. I continued making short films with no money, with the prize money, I just went on to make the glare and uh, the absence. Um, this is a film that I made. Now, this is a very important film for me because after I made the glare and won the prize again at the festival, these people came up to me, Lucas, Mary, and Jasmine. 
they came up to me. They were total strangers. And they said to me, we want to make films with you. She was going to edit. They were going to shoot it. And I didn't know them. And for free, for nothing, they said, you have a story to tell, and we want to help you do it. And they, we shot it on a 16mm film. And, you know, it was amazing. Jasmine even, uh, uh, you know, uh, she used to bring me into VHQ without anyone knowing at 2 o'clock in the morning for edits because I had no money to give her or pay for the edits. So this is how I made my films, with the kindness of all these other storytellers that I had met, and because they believed in what I wanted to say. And then, um, sorry, I'm very bad at this. I come from another generation. So, so after 10 years, okay, after that, after making Absence and making Brother and, you know, uh, these films, I stopped because I didn't know how, where, where else to go. I didn't know how to make a feature film. I had no money. You know, there was no SFC at the time or IMDA. It all came much later. But I had said, okay, that's it. I won three prizes. I can't do this anymore. And I decided to take a back seat. But 10 years later, a group of very young filmmakers who are all very famous now, all of them came up to me and they said they were going to make an omnibus film and they wanted me to be part of it. And I was like, are you sure? And they said, yes, they want me to be part of this lucky seven, seven directors making this film. And I said, I took it on as a challenge. I thought, oh, you know, they're all young. They're going to make this very experimental films. You know, I can't stick to my narratives, narratives anymore. You know, I can't be realistic anymore. I have to try something very different. And it was a big challenge. So I wrote this completely experimental film and presented it. Nobody understood what I was doing on set. There was this man in his red underwear running around in the desert. And, you know, and I, you know, and you, he was being whipped and things like that. And I thought, you know, it was very exciting for me, you know, to have this vision of, you know, I thought I was a visionary then, you know, like doing all this. Thing. And when the film came out, my film stood out, uh, stuck out because like a sore thumb, because everyone made a naturalistic film and mine was experimental. But it gave me another, it opened another door. Because the film went to Rotterdam, and then a curator from Oberhausen Film Festival saw the film, and then for the following year invited me to make another short film and submit it to that festival. So you see, I, if I didn't challenge myself, if I didn't change, I think I would have not made another film. If I, w I did not meet this group of young filmmakers, I would not have been encouraged to move on. My future would have been stuck in some motel, uh, being a night auditor. So, after that, I was, you know, invited to uh, do, you know, do work in the, uh, do a commission for the museum. Uh, I did uh, a, a whole lot of traveling, and I was invited, I, I, my two of my friends, Oman Das and Reina Pereira, invited me to make documentaries. You see, so then now, I quit my job. I was teaching uh, in Mainz uh, for the, uh, uh, f uh, for the mentally challenged, and I was, uh, uh, they told me, okay, since you like to tell stories, why don't you come on board and start making documentaries? And I did just that. It changed my life. I visited 45 countries in nine years because I was given an opportunity to tell my stories through these documentaries. And you know, one of the stories, I must relate the story to you because it, it, it affected me a lot. It was my first documentary, and they sent me to India because I was Indian. Uh, you know, okay, go to India, you are an Indian, you know, you'll tell a very good story there. So I went, and I was in Bhopal, in, and the, it was a sex temple, Kajraho, and uh, I was to make the story about the artisan who had, uh, 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 you know, comes from the family of uh, the sculptors who made the temple, and I had another profile who was a sex worker working in that same village. So when I went to visit the sex worker and to interview her, uh, it was in the middle of the night and we all went and of course I need, I need a translation because she only spoke Hindi, I couldn't speak Hindi. And then when we were sitting there talking to, she was telling us about how, uh, you know, the people who went to the temple, tourists who went to the temple would come to her and ask for positions, sexual positions that were related to the temple and you know, and then she started going, you know, she's getting very graphic with what she was talking. And then I said, 
should we stop? I told the translator to stop because her daughter was sitting there listening to her. She was a small girl. She was just listening to her. And I said, you know, can you ask her to send her daughter out of the room? And then she turned around to the translator and says, what does he want? He says, he wants your daughter out of the room because she thinks he's too, she's too young to listen to this. And she says, no, my daughter is 11 years old. Next year, she'll come of age. She'll become 12, and she's going to do my job. And I burst into tears. Because she, then she looked at me, why are you crying? Why are you crying for me? Don't cry for me. When I asked for 10 rupees, nobody gave me any money when I had these kids and no father. But when I, I took off my clothes, they just threw thousands of rupees at me. And she said, that is my life. Are you going to ch change my life if my daughter goes out? No, to, I have to live. Then that is my life. You can't change it, she said to me. And, you know, it taught me that, you know, I was being in a very sheltered world. You know, I thought that, you know, may, by, by making films, by making these documentaries, I could change lives and things like that. But there's sometimes there are realizations that, you know, different people have different lifestyles that you cannot do anything about. But by telling each story, maybe slowly, I told myself, by telling, by investing myself, investing my talent and creativity to tell these stories bit by bit, maybe there can be a change by creating awareness. So I decided to go on and do this completely full time as a freelance TV director. And then I came, I got a retrospective at the museum called you know, they told me, they gave me an award uh, and said that, okay, you've done great. You know, you have a whole lot of films that you have made, uh, your short films that you have made, we are giving you a retrospective. So I thought, there I go again. At the age of 45, they are going to tell me, okay, that's it, pack up, retire. And, you know, I made a film called Timeless, which was about an Indian man, the Indian man's role in the history of Singapore. So when, as a coolie, as a policeman during the racial riots in the 60s, and the other character was a gay character living in contemporary Singapore. It was about taboo, it was about stigma, and I needed to talk about it because sometimes when we talk about race, when we talk about uh, the color of our skin, sometimes, you know, it all comes out of ignorance. Why are people differentiating each other because we are different, uh, because we have a different skin color or a different culture? Why don't we try and make an effort to learn from each other, try to understand each other? And I got this big opportunity from Fran Borgia because he made me, he forced me to make a feature film. So just when I thought my career and my future was over in filmmaking, I met another storyteller who changed my life. He came up to me and he said, you are making a feature film. I didn't want to because I didn't, dare to, but he gave me the encouragement, and then I made A Yellow Bird, which went to Cannes uh, Film Festival, and, you know, which is a film that I'm very proud of, and it made me realize that I had a bright future and not a bleak future. You know, initially, every time when I was down and I thought that, you know, I was not going to make it, that I was too old, or, you know, I, I'm a minority, or I felt that I couldn't uh, um, do something, there were always these people, these stories that encouraged me and these storytellers who came into my life to tell me that I can move forward, I can do it. And that is very important. Listen to the people around us. Never disregard anyone. De listen to the stories, listen to people. You know, sometimes there's the person, the stranger that you meet, maybe the next person who's going to make a difference in your life. You see, the future of us is not uh, very, very far away from us. It is within us. It is about us. And it is with us. So I leave you now uh, with this very important um, uh, lines from a book that I read, To Kill a Mockingbird, when I was young, and made a great impact in my life. And that is, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Thank you very much. <laughs>